we'll start with public input, if there is any. Uh, where do we go for public input now? Over here somewhere? Right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, seeing none, uh, is there a motion on the consent agenda? Yep, move to approve <coughs> the consent agenda. Sir. Second. I'll second. Second. Is there anything anyone would like removed? All those in favor of the consent agenda? Four zero. Okay, we'll do reports now. Uh, we don't have any students. Uh, Ms. Webb? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would like to just sort of share with the community, the public and the committee members are already aware of this, um, but that Dr. Doherty um, received some outstanding recognition on uh, July 12th um, at the MASS Summer Institute. Um, so on Thursday, July 12th, Dr. Doherty was awarded the Dr. Christos Dalios, how do I say it? Dolos. Dolos, thank you. Uh, Christos Dolos Award at the Massachusetts Association of Sup School Superintendents Summer Executive Institute in Falmouth. The award is named after Christos Dulas, who was a former longtime superintendent of schools in Dracut and for years was called the Dean of Massachusetts Superintendents for his decades of service. The award is presented to a superintendent who has provided outstanding leadership and services to the superintendency, including the use of the written and spoken word, where Superintendent Dulos excelled. John is only the 22nd superintendent to receive the award in 25 years that it's been in existence. For receiving this award, Dr. Darty will address the superintendents at the MASS Winter Conference, which will be held in January. Um, we have some photos of the event, and um, we are just honored um, at this recognition. And I think that for folks in our district who have ever um, heard Dr. Darty address the community, whether that be at graduation or baccalaureate or um, first robotics or <laughs> drama festivals, I mean, um, uh, address the teachers and the staff, um, address town meeting with the states of the schools, um, and the, his ability to convey um, in an articulate and powerful manner um, what is essential about education for our students and our teachers and our staff is just really amazing. So we are just really uh, proud and grateful for um, all the service that Dr. Darty has provided to our district um, that earned him this award. And we, Reading Schools, are the great beneficiary of that. So really want to emphasize and highlight that award. And thank you very much, Dr. Darty. Thank you. Thank you. Two reports. One is I am now the liaison for RACASA Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, and I'm thrilled um, to have a more formal role with that organization now. I'm so pleased, and uh, I'm so pleased that they're in Reading. And Erica McNamara, the director, is right here. Um, this summer, they were also honored with an award in the educational events category of SAMHSA's National 2017 Recovery Month Annual Event Award Program. SAMHSA is actually the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It's a national organization. Um, and, and they announced that RACASA's event, Reading Unites for Recovery, was selected by a panel of judges as the winner in this category. Um, and Reading Unites for Recovery was, when I learned what it was, I was just wowed. It was a coordinated series of educational activities designed to raise awareness, share resources, and celebrate recovery. Kudos to both Director Erica McNamara and RACASA Outreach Coordinator Julianne DeAngelis and the RACASA Board for all they've accomplished for our community. This national recognition is a powerful acknowledgement of the vital role that RACASA plays in our community and abroad and beyond. Um, a letter from Leanne De, Fra De Francesco, the Vice President of Vanguard Communications wrote, your event was recognized as exceedingly, as exceeding expectations and as a reflection of your commitment to expand the breadth and reach of National Recovery Month in 2017. As a result of winning this award, 
A delegate of RACASA has been invited to travel all expenses paid to Washington, D.C. to attend events sponsored by the National Council for Behavioral Health. And I wanted to read something that um, Director McNamara wrote to me. She said, we couldn't have done it without Dr. Doherty's support in planning the various events, including the use of school buildings and resources. Sherry Vandenacker and Dr. Doherty were a huge part of last year's Recovery Month in promoting the events via a special segment taped at RCTV. Thank you, RCTV. Their attendance and involvement throughout the month, including hosting our first recovery celebration and candlelight vigil in, vigil in Reading at RMHS in memory of lives lost to substance use. As the former Vice President of RACASA, Elaine Webb, also from the school committee, thank you, Elaine, mm -hmm. was involved in our first business breakfast with the chamber and co-hosting our annual meeting featuring Dr., and I'm gonna say his name wrong, Pote? Ruth Pody. Pody. Um, and I was there, so I should have known. It wasn't, anyways. Dr. Pody and Marion Ryan during last year's Recovery Month. Tom Zaya, Assistant Director of Extracurriculars, was a major support in pulling off the recovery celebration and being able to, quote, ring the bell for recovery. At that annual meeting, RACASA presented DA Ryan with 55 Project Linus blankets, which were made with the First Congregational Church at their old Reading Fair, and the blankets are being used to comfort children who witness substance abuse tragedies. Um, and this was really important that this trauma was recognized and something was done to help these children. And this is only a snapshot of the events organized as a part of Reading Unites for Recovery. Um, I actually have more information that I have already sent to Linda Engelson, so she'll have that in the minutes rather than read the whole thing. Um, so in addition to the RACASA report, um, oh, also, there is, um, take your calendars out and write this down. RACASA's annual meeting is scheduled for Thursday, September 27th. It's really important to go. I've learned something at every one. Um, so put September 27th, Thursday, in your calendar. And all RACASA meetings are held the last Thursday of the month from 5.30 to 6.30 in the community room at the police station. The next meeting is on August 30th from 5.30 to 6.30. So my second report is on Jams for Jake. Um, as David Maroney's spotlight column highlighted, the Beat Heart Foundation was established this past April by nine young adults who grew up in Reading and graduated from the Reading schools to provide spaces in the community for creative expression while raising resources and awareness for addiction in light of the growing academic <laughs> epidemic. <laughs> These organizers were inspired by their friend, Jake Suzwa, whose musical creativity and talent rocked their world through his songwriting, music, and friendship, and then ultimately by his untimely death due to an overdose. Now there are seven high school RMHS alums on the board of directors, 13 RMHS alums on the core staff, and many more Reading students and alum who attend the Beat Heart events and volunteer. Their energy and mission are contagious and their impact is really powerful. This last Sunday was their second annual Jams for Jake event. They exuded the grit so often articulated as the goal for our school. Despite the torrential rains on Saturday, they regrouped to hold their event on its rain date Sunday under glorious blue and sweltering skies. The music was awesome, the organizers were skilled and passionate, and the resources available were helpful. I myself was trained in administering Narcan and received instructions on how to purchase it to have it available should a need arise. Simon's Field resonated with the band's playing oral testimonies and resources to support those grappling with addiction and those who want to support them. Between the first Jams for Jake event last November and this second Jams for Jake event, this motivated group held coffee houses, raid fun raised funds, approached sponsors, and worked with town leadership to share their message. RACASA had a table at Jams for Jake where Director Erica McNamara, student James Rigney, and others shared vital resources. Last year's funds have provided a community service grant 
Community Service Grant to Lydia Friedman, an RMHS sophomore for her high school proje project, the Green Ribbon Project, which aims to provide support for high school students coping with mental, mental illness. Beadheart will be right beside her as she transforms her idea into reality. This year's funds will go to supporting Rakasa, another grant for another community service project, two coffee houses, a series of Narcan educational nights, and next year's Jams for Jake. Stay tuned for the date of an open mic coffee house in the latter part of October. All Beat Heart events are substance free. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, I just have um, a brief update on extended school year. So we ran a five-week summer program for students who had services identified through their IEPs. Um, this year it was run and coordinated by Allison Wright, the new Assistant Director of Student Services. There were 293 students who were recommended at the end of the school year uh, for the programming, and we had 202 students attend either in part or in whole. So. We, she averaged said, about 68% of our students who were recommended for ESY attended at least a portion of the program. Um, and we had 71 staff members who were working the program, and tomorrow is their last day. Um, it seemed to go very smoothly, even with the um, paving that's <laughs> happening over by yeah. Birch Meadow. Um, the programs were run at Birch Meadow, Coolidge, and the Rise Preschool here at the high school. So overall, I think we had a very successful program. Um, and then just my second announcement, which Dr. Doherty did share out, is that I have submitted my resignation to Dr. Doherty. Um, I will be moving on to a, a new position and an exciting opportunity for me professionally. Uh, but I would like to thank Dr. Doherty for my time here in my four years, really having the opportunity to grow as an administrator. I've worked with an amazing group of educational leaders who truly are focused on students, and it has been great to see the changes that have happened and the commitment that our educators have to the students um, here in Reading. So I will miss that and bring those experiences with me. Um, but I'm here. We haven't actually... Um, determined the last day, so we'll be working on that and communicating out to the community kind of next steps and what the plan will be. Um, so it's not like I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> we will be working together on something that works for the district um, and in supporting that transition. So I am here and working. So. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for having me tonight. It's my first school committee meeting. Um, I have been spending the last six weeks, I can't believe I've been in this position six weeks, um, working on my entry plan, which I did put out to the community, and I hope you had a chance to look at it. Um, this binder is filled with notes from dozens and dozens of meetings. Uh, before I come up with lots of strategic plans on next steps, I really had to spend time getting to know folks. Uh, I've started with the instructional leaders in the district, I've met with all the principals, I've met with most of the department heads, the assistant principals at the high school, um, as well as the folks that report to me, like uh, Medco and Extended Day and ELL, um, and obviously the central office team, and congratulations, Carolyn. Uh, and we only spent a month together, but uh, we worked well together in that month, so. Uh, and we have more time. We still have more time. <laughs> I'm gonna pick her brain until she's at her last moment here. Um, the entry plan right now is, is actually a little ahead of schedule as far as I'm just about done with entry meetings. Um, the two coordinator positions at the elementary K to six position have been integral. Uh, as I'm sure you realize, we had uh, hired Heather Leonard before I started here, moving out of the Barrows principalship into the STEM coordinator position and we hired a humanities coordinator, Allison Stracker, uh, and she started and she's terrific as well. So they have been meeting with me uh, several times a week to go over steps. We're looking, we're reviewing documents right now, looking at assessment calendars and timelines and things like that. Um, but I just wanted to remind all of you that all of the things that we're doing will be continuously posted on my blog. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you haven't already joined, I know I've, I have a few followers, but not a lot. Um, it's RPS Teaching and Learning at WordPress. Um, but certainly, 
I'm going to really try to fill that. We're working on updating the website. Um, actually, Carolyn's website has been a great in inspiration. The special ed uh, student services site at the Reading Schools um, has a lot of information on it, and I've spent some time looking at the various websites. Um, so we're going to update the curriculum websites uh, and populate them. So that's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, super excited to be here. I just want to uh, shout out to the uh, principals and the central office team, including uh, these three that have been super supportive. Um, I feel lucky to be working in the community that I live in. I actually knew who people were before I got here, um, but it's been a very fast six weeks, and um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to just every day learning more and seeing where we're headed. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Mine will be covered. <laughs> Dr. I have a couple of things. Um, first of all, I, I do want to echo what Carolyn said, and I want to thank her for her four years here. Um, seems longer than four years. <laughs> all the things that have been going on, but, but thank you very much for everything you have done for the children of Reading. We really appreciate it, and good luck. Good luck in your next exciting opportunity. Um, and as, as Carolyn said, we are working on a transition plan and a, and a process. Um, most likely, as I, I sent out in the announcement, we will be looking at an interim for the year, um, not to start a search. I don't think this is a good time to do a search. Um, so we'll be looking at someone that that has been a, a re, perhaps a retired special education director who, um, you know, that can hit the ground running and to really focus on the things um, that we need to do to, to to keep our uh, special educa education programs intact and um, moving forward. Um, the good news is that we have a new position, an assistant director's position, who's gonna be able to really strengthen and work with our team chairs and our principals and, and our teachers um, with those programs. So, um, and that's Allison Wright. And Allison has been in the school district for the last few years. So we're very excited that we have that position and that we have someone that is very well qualified to to work in that role. So um, the other the other pieces I want to talk about, uh, which some people know if they've come to central office, is that we are now all in one location, uh, which is great. It's something that we've wanted to do for a long time, but we've now been able to do it. And, uh, the beginning of the summer as we were closing out the fiscal year and uh, several other things were going on. Uh, we, did, we did several moves at the same time, um, moving um, extended day staff and technology staff um, upstairs um, to different locations and moving uh, uh, Office of Teaching and Learning downstairs, um, it, which also included the moving, moving of several files and file cabinets and and everything else that goes along with that. So it was a very well coordinated team effort to get this all done as there were a lot of other things going on. So I wanna thank all of the people that were involved, particularly the facilities department um, who did yeoman's work um, to make that happen. We also did some high school moves at the same time. Um, the high school administration office is now all also pretty much in one place. Um, and we're very excited about that too. And I know that's something that Kate uh, Boynton, who is here this evening, um, wanted as well. So um, it, we're looking forward to having everyone together. We we're gonna be able to communicate more efficiently and effectively and, um, and that'll, that'll be great. Also, as part of that, as you've noticed, we are now up here. Um, so the school committee meetings will now be here in this library moving forward, um, which we think is a much better venue uh, for, for a public meeting. There's more space, obviously, than the room that we've uh, been using for the last several years. So it's all part of a change in plans. Um, I do want to point out one correspondence in the packet from an Eileen Bornstein. Um, that you received way back on June 25th. Um, I did call uh, Ms. Bornstein and talk to her um, so that she understood the situation. Um, she was getting all her information uh, from the media. And so when I explained to her exactly um, what was going on that evening uh, with the t television 
uh, production trucks that were in front of the school uh, with the Parker eighth grade dance and how they were ready to start interviewing students about the situation. She completely understood that that was not an appropriate place for the media uh, to be interviewing students uh, on either tape or live television. So we had a very good conversation. She thanked me for um, for following up with her uh, on her email to the school committee. So I wanted the committee to know I did reach out to, to Ms. Bornstein on that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, we are in the process of doing, and we'll, we'll be giving you a much further report um, at our April th uh, August 30th meeting is that we have been doing a lot of hiring this summer um, for positions that were part of the override, which is exciting, um, but also for some of the positions where there was turnover. And we are in a very, very good shape right now for hiring. We have a couple of positions still out there, and uh, I know our principals are working very hard to fill them, but um, compared to other years at this time, we're in a very good place in the, in the hiring process. But we will give you a much more detailed uh, quarterly report. Jen Bovey will come and do that at a, at a later date. So that's that's uh, my report for this evening. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, Gail, we can jump right into the Great. budget. Thank you. Included in the packet is a memo summarizing the FY19 budget. What we wanted to do, um, all of the pieces agree to everything we discussed during the budget process. So the school committee budget, the override budget, and then the total budget all agree to what was discussed and presented and approved at town meeting. But what we wanted to do was put it all in one memo so everyone could see all of the pieces and then have school committee do their formal vote by call center on each of the pieces. The adjustments and reconciling items that are laid out in here agree to the various presentations that we did. The one column, the salary adjustment, agrees to what we had discussed during the budget process as well as town meeting that the override number that we had put forth was to attract and retain staff across the district. So we have put a preliminary allocation <coughs> across all of the various cost centers and then once we go through the year and as you know we're in the process of negotiating all of our contracts so once we have all final figures we may have some adjustments but this was the approach we took to allocate it across all of the cost centers. One of the other items that we will be doing similar to last year we're looking to enhance the reporting that we are doing. So in addition to reporting back quarterly on any salary savings, any cost savings or other items, we will also be reporting on how we are trending against the specific override items. So we will be reporting back how we are doing filling the positions as well as dollar amounts, what we're doing. The position ones are easy to say we filled them and how we're doing, but we will also be reporting out on the curriculum updates, the professional development as well as the technology computer replacement. So we will be prepared at each one of our meetings to discuss the plan we have in place and how we are spending that money. So tonight we just wanted to have the formal vote since mm -hmm. we had voted all of the various pieces. <laughs> this is just the final step for the whole okay. budget. I'll read the motion. <coughs> Move to approve the FY19 budget of $44,860,275 as appropriated by town meeting with the following amounts by cost center. Administration, <coughs> $1,061,384. Regular day, $26,647,725. Sorry. Um, special Education, $13,899,069. School Facilities, $1,325,220. And District-wide Programs, $1,926,877. Is there a Sorry. second? Second. <coughs> Is there any discussion or questions? No. Seeing none, we'll vote on the motion. All those in favor? Zero. Thank you, Gail. The, if I can just, the second memo that we have in 
the FY19 capital plan. The capital plan was presented and discussed and voted on as part of the budget meetings in January. There actually have been no changes to the capital plan. What was presented as part of those budget meetings was what was approved at town meeting. We did want to let the committee know that at the next school committee meeting, August 30th, yep. um, we will have Joe Huggins here. We, he will go through in a little bit more detail. He will actually discuss the closeout of the FY18 <laughs> capital plan, go into detail on the FY19 capital plan, as well as discuss if we have come across any items that we would be looking to bring forth to town meeting in November. So he will be here. Um, to discuss all of these pieces. But this was just to get the, again, no changes were made, but to get the final school committee vote on a capital plan. The motion. Yep, move to approve the FY19 capital plan as it relates to the school department in the amount of $835,000. Second, any questions? All those in favor? Four zero. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have enrollment on here? So um, I actually just realized that yeah. Yeah. I do you want to just go back to talk about that? enrollment during my report. Yeah. Right. Um, so I can do it now or I can yeah, do it. Yeah, then why not? So in your packet, and I apologize, because I, we took it as an agenda, off as an agenda, because I was going to put it in my report. Um, so as we have, and you'll get a um, more final enrollment report um, the first day of school on the August 30th meeting. Um, there's an enrollment report in your packet, which uh, as you can see, and I'm trying to find it in my packet, I know it's in here somewhere. Um, as you can see that for the most part, the class sizes across the board at the elementary are in the, the range of the, actually I think all of them are, are in the, the K to two range. Um, of 18 to 22, and then the mid 20s for grades three through five. Uh, we at this point um, have been able to have any sibling that wanted full day kindergarten at their neighborhood school uh, be able to uh, access full day kindergarten. We also, to the best of my knowledge, to have no one on the wait list for full day kindergarten. Uh, so we were able to do that as well. So. Um, all of the things that we had put in place last uh, winter, last um, early spring, uh, regarding, thank you very much, regarding kindergarten um, are, are going along smoothly. Uh, we are still getting some changes in enrollment. We are, people are starting to call us and uh, that have been moving into town and so these numbers are still in flux, but right now the, the class sizes at the elementary are looking very, very good. And you can see also on the back side of the enrollment, um, the middle school and the, the, the high school as well um, were in fairly good shape. So we'll give you a much more complete report um, on, at August 30th, but I just wanted to give you a quick check-in on, on enrollment and that, that right now we're, we're in very good shape. So Wood End is something we gotta keep an eye on? Or? Wood End for uh, uh, second, second grade. and third grade, well second grade. Yeah, yeah. Although there isn't, uh, we do not have any additional classroom space, it, it wouldn't. First, the next item on the agenda, I'll put the motion on the table Be first. Before you do that, oh. can I, and, and I may have missed it, did you talk about the reorg? I no. said getting we okay. only have four. But you did say it's getting, okay. I just, I didn't specifically say the reorg. I said not, the agenda has changed. Okay. Yeah. So. Sorry. We're not reorging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're waiting till we have the full board to do the vote. <clears throat> Um, not because I want to sit here for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the motion related to the superintendent's FY18 vacation buyback is to move to authorize the payment of up to 5,500 in vacation buyback to the superintendent, John Doherty, for the 2017-18 fiscal year as a one-time non-precedent setting compensation. So put that on the table. Is there a second? Second. 
Um, so just a, some background. Um, in the school district portion of the municipal employees, there is no um, vacation buyback in the contracts. There's been a little bit of confusion about this in the community. Um, there has been no vacation buyback for Dr. Darty during his nine-year tenure as a superintendent. Um, and there is none in the current contract. Um, I would note that under state law, when an employee retires or leaves a company or employment, the accrued vacation liability must be paid to the employee. That's state law. Um, the, co the committee, school committee, um, sort of made this decision or looks at this decision due to the extreme demands um, and the unique demands of this year, which among other things include operating with unfilled staff positions, um, putting together two budgets, um, both of which had accelerated timelines, um, sort of all the issues and presentations with the override, which I think we noted that there were 60 nights of basically evening, uh, or 60 different meetings, evening or um, sessions, and when we have the evening meetings, those days are about 18 hours long. Um, negotiations, we have, we have, and actually are still in that process of negotiations, and multiple staff search processes. So um, Dr. Darty had 20 unused vacation days, and he could only carry five over in FY18. Um, the 15 days um, that would have been absolutely lost were would have val been uh, were valued at um, $10,561, and the committee um, has before us and did approve an executive session and has before us tonight um, a $5,500 uh, payment, which equates to 7.8 days or. Um, three percent, so it's only a portion of the days that um, would have been lost, so he, in fact, um, has lost uh, 7.2 days. You know, I'll just say, as is the process, Ms. Webb just touched on it, we did have a lengthy discussion uh, with the full entire committee uh, in executive session about a month ago, I guess. Before the end of the fiscal year. It was June 4th. Uh, June 4th. Yeah, so more than a month. So. Uh, a vote of four here tonight is there was a vote of a six at the executive session. And um, the committee um, members in general deeply appreciate the extenuating um, situations this year presented and Dr. Darty's commitment to really meet every deadline and wants to emphasize that this is a non-precedent setting, one-time decision for this payment. It's not something that the committee took lightly or does routinely, and it's not something that's in any of our, um, from a municipal perspective, it's not in our school district employee contracts. Um, and uh, so, uh, we have the motion on the table uh, before us again is to authorize the 5500 in vacation pay back for FY19, FY18. <coughs> is there any questions or comments? Yes. Just my comment, I wish it could be more. I just think that the, how hard Dr. Darty worked last year was superhuman. Um, but he has insisted on no raises for two years and um, respecting that, I just think this is a really important thing for us to do. He couldn't take their vacation, so I really feel strongly. We ought to do this, buy it back. With gratitude. Mm -hmm. Let's see, no more. Yeah, we can have the vote. In favor, 4 0. Thank you. The student handbook. Do you want to? I'll just do a quick introduction. Sure. Um, so, <laughs> I'd like you to officially meet our new high school principal, yeah. Kate Boynton. Um, who has also been going through a very rigorous entry plan process, um, meeting with a lot of people, which I know she'll um, tell you a little bit about. Uh, this evening she's going to talk to you about um, some handbook changes and a couple of other things, um, just as updates that are going on at the high school. Um, so annually by law, the school committee does approve the high school handbook. So that is, and you do this pretty much this time every year. So. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Boyd. Where should I stand? I'm with you. Thank you. If that works for you. Yeah, it works great. 
Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here and, uh, and honored to, uh, to be part of the, the Reading Public School community. So I thank you so much. Uh, as Chris mentioned before, uh, I'm six weeks in uh, to my position and well into the entry plan process. Uh, I looked uh, and did sort of a self check today and I am ahead of the game uh, as well, making some great progress, meeting with all stakeholders, parents, uh, parent groups, community groups, teachers, administrators, uh, and um, you know the feedback has been just fantastic. Uh, so well underway. Uh, more to be done for sure, but I, I'm ahead of schedule where I thought I would be at this time. Uh, the hiring process, as John mentioned, we're um, well underway into hiring um, very key positions at the high school with a few more left, but I feel really quite confident uh, that we're gonna get some wonderful folks. We've got some highly qualified and highly interested folks that we're, uh, we're bringing on board. So we're very excited excited about that as well. Uh, have a, a NEASC update. I met with our two NEASC okay. chairs mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, and our collaborative conference visit is early in November, November 8th and 9th. Uh, so there'll be four members of the NEASC team coming to visit in this sort of just post our um, our self uh, kind of self assessment and self reflection period. So there'll be a chair and three additional uh, folks from NEASC coming to visit over a two day period. And that first day, November 8th, will be meeting with all stakeholders, so we'll bring in folks from the school committee. Naturally, they want to meet with as many stakeholders uh, from the high school and school community as possible. That'll be the morning of the 8th. After that, they'll be visiting classrooms and kind of wandering. Um, you know, we'll guide them in the direction that we'd like them to go see, but they will have um, full accessibility to the building <coughs> to observe classes, uh, really looking in at those five key standards. And then uh, following that visit on, on Thursday, the, the 8th, the 9th, will be a day where they do some reflection and writing, and there'll be a report that gets submitted to me. Um, and based on the report, there's recommendations that get made for us based on our, our needs that they see which should mirror really our self-assessment. Um, they'll, they'll likely highlight the self-assessment. Our, our chairs have done a very, very thorough job and they're almost completed uh, looking in at, at the five key standard areas. Um, they'll have that done by September. The faculty needs to take a vote to approve the areas of need that, that we see. Uh, that'll happen in, uh, in, no, in early, no, early November as well as our, our projected timeline just before the visit uh, from NEASC. And then we've got about a two year process of following that period to, to really fix anything that they, you know, they highlight as, as key areas of need. And the final visit will occur in, I believe, December of 2020 is the time frame. So we're looking really quite in good shape. Our two chairs, I have to give a shout out to uh, Jennifer um, Hagopian and I'm forgetting the uh, oh, other person. She's a math teacher. She's Danielle, Danielle, Danielle Jones. Yes. Danielle Jones. Danielle, and she has a new last name. She's uh, yes. newly, yes. newly married, uh, which delayed our delayed our meeting. She was on her honeymoon, but they have really done a fantastic job. So we're in great shape with NEASC. And George Edwards and, and I from NEASC have been in touch. So I'll be um, getting his input as well. And they um, they couldn't say enough about how helpful he is. So I'm looking forward to meeting with him. Uh, on to the handbook. So if questions about NEASC, happy to, happy to answer questions as I know them uh, right now, but that's what you have is the information that I have. Uh, so the handbook, um, being new to my position, I, I really didn't make any, we didn't make any substantive changes to any policy in the handbook. Uh, I felt very strongly about that, really wanting to kind of dig my heels into uh, getting to know the culture of the school and um, from my perspective, having worked on handbook changes in the past, in my prior districts, it really is a community effort to make sure that those are done well and not capriciously. So um, we'll be taking a full look this year at various high school policies and procedures to make sure that, um, you know, that any and all changes are done uh, very mindfully and sensitively looking uh, at all stakeholders. Uh, this, the, um, school council also takes a look and kind of vets the handbook changes as well. So we'll be in involving them. I would like to just point out and have it in the, the change memo, one change to the bell schedule, which I think uh, perhaps surprised a few people, and that was the removal of 
the uh, teacher office hours schedule, so I can explain a little bit about that. There were really two main factors that went into that. Time on learning was impacted and we weren't meeting our 990, and got feedback from, uh, in particular from parents and, and students as well as teachers, that the bell schedule was confusing and um, many, many weeks there were four different bell schedules as a result of having office hours, Wednesday early release and flex block. And you have four different bell schedules in a five day week. People didn't know if they were coming or going. So we, I heard that from multiple constituents and wanted to, to honor that and recognize that. And so one thing that we were able to do was to move flex block to Wednesday and every single Wednesday except the early release Wednesdays will be flex block. So what that does wow. is normalize flex blocks they're predictable, they're every Wednesday except early release, and then every single Wednesday is a modified bell schedule. So it streamlines things, and it fully Im it fully embeds the flex blocks, which were, were done um, not every Thursday. So it really normalizes them, embeds them into the school, allows for our guidance department to really fully map out their curriculum for the year so that we can have that schedule communicated out to teachers as well as to students so they know that if they're a senior, this is when their guidance seminars are going to be for college readiness and preparation mm -hmm. for our freshmen. Here's when they're going to be. Uh, and then it also fully uh, you know, more fully embeds time for intervention uh, in, into the school day. So flex blocks is third period. So those were really the driving factors behind it. And then, you know, naturally with Chris and I and um, a few other folks, we'll be taking a look at the late start and, and I think looking at the possibility of, of an office hours kind of thing is certainly something that we'll consider more long term as we take a look at, you know, with the late start committee. Um, the other major change, and I'm going to invite Erica McNamara <coughs> to come on up, is the just hold up. Yeah, oh, I'm change, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. I just had a question on the late. So, that, I mean, where is the rest of the Middlesex League at this point? I've got a lot of questions about that. It's so about about half. Maybe a little bit less than half of one the Middlesex seven. League. Was it? <laughs> one less than half. One less than half <laughs> yeah. of the Middlesex League teams so uh, implemented it uh, for this upcoming school year. Yeah. Uh, the rest will be doing it the following year. Um, part of the, I mean, we strategically did not right. focus on late start last year because there was a lot of things going right. on in the community. Right. <laughs> In some of the other communities, uh, there were new superintendents, or there was a turnover in superintendents. So those communities chose not to move forward with late starts in those years, mm -hmm. uh, and, and for next year. But there is a commitment by the Middlesex League for the 1920 school year. Mm -hmm. And um, is um, our new assistant superintendent who's leading that? I guess we're going to be you guys co-chairing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. And the, uh, so in terms of like the events that, like uh, extracurricular events, the schools that are on different times, that they're accommodating us. I so the ADs are already meeting to talk about that. I believe right now in the middle sex league, the latest uh, end time is 310. Mm -hmm. So all the schedules, uh, all the games in the middle sex league will be uh, factored into that. So they're definitely looking at that. Obviously, the hard part is when it gets dark early, right? right. So they're looking at the way they schedule. Um, I do think because half of the districts are already going to that model, there will be some plans in place so that as we look at what works for Reading, yeah. we will have kind of a baseline of how that works. So um, I met with Tom Zaya the other day. Kate and I have already talked. Lena Williams is going to be on it. Okay, uh, part. Good. We're going to be uh, looking for a smaller group. I know when it was, oh, it was a very large be, group. The last time there were a lot of players, but it was really just the infancy of talking about mm -hmm. late start. I think we're three or four years after that now, and the research has been really out there, and other communities have moved towards it. So we're going to try to streamline that process because our plan is to look at the calendar for next year and the schedule. So our team will be fully up and running mid-September, and uh, we should have a decision early, you know, enough that parents will have ample time mm -hmm. to plan. Great. Thank you. 
So what I would say as well, in, in just in terms of the, the handbook, um, the, the, the current format, I've gotten feedback that it's not as user-friendly as it could be, and so we're looking to update and enliven the, the format to make it more user-friendly, uh, to more effectively digitize it so that there are links embedded within the handbook as well that, um, that allow for just easier perusing, finding what you need to find within the handbook. So updating the format, not, not necessarily so much the substance, but looking at the formatting as well to make sure that it is much more user-friendly than it currently is. Uh, there are some minor changes to some language around uh, core values, adding goal instead of uh, a concern to have it be framed more positively, taking a look at um, cleaning up some attendance language that was confusing, uh, looking at general behavior guidelines, uh, naming uh, behaviors that uh, our assistant principals have had to address that were not present in the handbook. Um, those were there. Um, our assistant principals are most definitely, and myself, uh, taking a look at looking at some restorative justice practices to embed for some of our more lower level behavioral um, uh, actions that students uh, engage in um, to have it be more of an educational, uh, have an educational component, a restorative justice component. Uh, for some, uh, you know, for some behaviors it's appropriate and for some behaviors it's not, but they and myself want to take a look at, um, at getting training uh, in restorative justice to see where it would fit uh, in terms of our, our consequences. And then the section that is most different, I would say, would be the chemical health section. And I'd like to invite Erica up uh, to share a little bit um, kind of about this. And one thing to emphasize is that there is not any policy change, it just, the past section, the prior section, was very, very confusing. So sort of what you see here mm -hmm. is potentially, uh, you know, a glimpse into what um, the, a newly formatted handbook would, would look like. So we took district policy and, and put it in an appendix um, because it was muddying the waters in terms of actions taken um, and consequences for, for kiddos. So what you see here is kind of a, a fresh look uh, and a, just a new configuration in our chemical health policy, which I have Erica really to thank for this. I jumped right in and this work was already underway and Erica had done a lot of work looking at some other districts and, and what they uh, had and how, ha how they had it formatted. So I really have her to thank. We met uh, at length, myself, Tom Zaya, um, Jess Therio, at Mike McSweeney, uh, Erica and Brian Lewis, thank you. Uh, we all met uh, just to make sure since we were the parties, uh, are the parties that really are involved in, in this, to make sure we were all on the same page. So that would be considered Opin opinion. Sort of opinion. Yeah. <coughs> we'll have the second reading at the next meeting. I think you're supposed to. So we get a star. Yeah, yeah. We'll start reading. Right. We have to approve this first reading or vote on the first reading, and then there'll be a second reading. Is that correct? Right. But you actually have to start. We have to start reading. Oh, reading. sorry. I will. <laughs> sorry. Um, po uh, policy J I C H. Drug and alcohol use by students is, um, well, now will be alcohol, tobacco, and drug use by students prohibited. I move a that student we shall go the reading yes. because we have it in front of us. Yeah. Second. Is there a second? All yeah. those in favor of the following reading? Four zero. Um, okay, so. Uh, but then we still have to accept the reading. No. No, you just did. We oh, just did. did. Okay. So Great. we'll take a look at Sorry. this and then if there's second anything reading. that we want to change or would get it to you before the Please, next yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. So, right, any uh, questions to Dr. Doherty prior to the 30th? Yeah. And I'll m m make sure that the committee members that aren't here know that too. Sure. <coughs> we can do that. Yep. And then we have another policy, um, sorry. Move, that's policy EBC, move to accept the first reading of revised policy EBC school safety. Um, Dr. Dar, do you wanna give a brief introduction? Second. Oh, sorry. Oh, second. Yeah. Dr. Dar. Yes, thank you. Um, one, of, one of the areas that are gonna be a main focus point for our district this year is gonna be school safety. Um, in light of everything that has been going on in our country, 
uh, regarding um, you know, school shootings and other safety situations that have happened in our schools and beyond our schools um, is going to be an increased focus for us this year on, on school safety, um, which will include uh, attention to drills more uh, than we, uh, even more detail to drills. We're taking a look at campus-wide evacuation drill. We did one a few years ago. Um, so we're, we're taking a look at a couple of different ways to uh, improve, enhance our school safety plans. Um, <coughs> and we'll go into more detail later on in that, but that, that's part of the basis of this. STARS and MLEC has a whole toolkit on school safety uh, and district plans, and uh, one of the pieces they have is an actual uh, policy on school safety. You do have a policy on school safety, but um, this one actually breaks it down even further. Uh, so what you are approving on a first reading tonight is the STARS and MLEC recommended policy for EBC on emergency plans. Um, so that's really the, the summary and the, the background behind this. And just to clarify, it's really replacing, for the most part, the existing policy? Or the existing policy of EBC, correct. Right. That's all the strike through. So the, the majority back. of the changes are in blue. Yes. Well, blue and red, right? Is that blue right? Blue and green. Um, oh, is it green? It's green, blue and green. Oh. Yeah, I guess that's green, yes. Blue and green. <laughs> Okay, let me start reading, sorry. Um, policy EBC emergency plans, the Reading School Committee and members of the school department are committed to providing a safe, orderly, and productive learning environment for, for all members of the school community. Advanced planning for emergencies and disasters. Okay, I, I move Dr. that. Doctor has a motion. <laughs> that we forgo the reading to um, come back to that to vote on it now for the first reading and come back. Second. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Four to zero. Thank you. Again with this if you have any yes. questions. Yes. And uh, just so you know, I, I we will go into a much more detailed update on school safety later on. Um but later I just want you to know that we are we are in the process of, of doing some other changes this year. I, I, I just so I was at the safety summit. Uh, when was that? Was in June, uh, was May? June, yeah. June, May, June. So, so is it? Spring. So you're going to add to what was presented that night? Uh, I'm going to give you an update of the things that we're doing in the schools. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to um, clarify, Dr. Hardy, when you were speaking earlier, sort of giving an overview. You um, used the words "our schools." And I think sometimes when you were using the word our schools, you were referring to nationally and some of the incidents. I just want to make sure that people understand that there's been, that those, you, some of your comments you were talking about things that happen in our schools, like for instance, school shootings at Park. Oh, I just want to make oh sure nationally, yes. Yes, I'm sorry, that people I think I'm did not I mean our Reading no, Public, public Schools. Public schools right. no. I just want to clarify. I apologize that. if that came No, I think we, we're, and many of us use it interchangeably mm -hmm. because we are, you know, thinking of this, this is a national issue. Yes. And so this measure is, um, you know, we, we've been very proactive. I think um, just as a, the governor, the governor, and you probably talk about this more, I guess, when we do the update, the governor made some, put some funding towards, did we already talk about that at a committee meeting or no? Uh, no, um, but I can, I, actually he is coming to speak to a group of superintendents um, in a couple of weeks at Burlington High School and I've been invited to attend that. Oh, great. So I will be going to that and he's gonna talk about the $72 million that has been allocated for counselors, uh, school safety, social workers. I, I thought when I saw that, I thought I was very proud of our community because I think that, you know, we had started working with the consultant, I don't know when the town we did, but maybe at least a year ago, but we have also sort of been at the forefront in terms of a lot of planning. And I think it really positions us well, hopefully, to be able to take advantage of the additional support that the state's gonna provide. Um, so that's yes. great to hear. I actually would like to add to that. I mean, I was part of an emergency manage, management um, committee 15 years ago, 2008. With Franklin. 
Yes, yes. With Frank Orlando. Oh, wow. So it started a long years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Relative said 15, so I guess I was yeah. right. exaggerating. And, and one of the, and two, actually, this is a good segue. One of the things that we have updated was the document that we put together in 2008. Right? Put together. Which at that time was quite a document. Right. Okay. Uh, where are we? I think we're, we basically are done with our agenda. And a motion to go to the agenda. So um, we're going to go into executive session. Before, um, before you do, I think oh. you wanted to talk about the calendar. Oh, we did. So we, um, the school committee calendar is in the packet, and um, school committee members, we, we have a new um, meeting calendar that reflects most of our meetings will be on Thursdays. The school committee members um, are excited about that as we think it'll be a more manageable process for us and for the staff. And um, when our meetings do go late and long and are arduous, we only have to get to a Friday <laughs> instead of the entire rest of the week. Um, and it should help to make the work of the staff around getting packets done um, to the work, the standard work week instead of the extended work weeks through the weekend. So we, um, I appreciate that all the committee members um, Chairman Robinson um, put that out there, but I did some of the one-on-one -on -one conversations, and um, so this is our new calendar, and our next meeting is actually a Thursday, August 30th. This meeting being a Wednesday was just because of coordinating the summer schedules was really difficult, um, and then our meeting after that would be Thursday, September 20th, and people can will find the schedule where they always do, so excellent. Um, the motion for executive session. Yep, to protect the bargaining position of the board, I move that we enter to executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining and not to return to open session. Second. Is there a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Yes. Yes. 